G'day. Isn't it great to sing some Christmas carols? There are other people that appreciate, like it's nice to hear them in um, shopping centres occasionally, but I think there's something special about being able to sing them and not just see them on telly or something like that. Because aside from, you know, those reassuring tunes that you've heard since you were little, um, the actual words again really just, I don't know, there's something so deep and wonderful about it. So uh, I trust you enjoyed it too. And if not, then, well, get on board because there'll be some more. Uh, so today I want to start by talking about the myth of the perfect Christmas. Uh, I trust if you go anywhere, um, re- you know, even related to a shop or anything, even you know, if you pick up, pick up your phone and search online, you'll see just getting smashed again and again and again about Christmas and how perfect it can be. But so often it's not. I actually kind of think the whole kind of myth of this perfect, stylized, ideal Christmas, like, like obviously, you know, it's nice to have a shot at, you know, modern day um, advertisers and the shops. And if you go along to, you know, Myers or David Jones or somewhere stylish, like, you know, especially for, I mean, maybe not Kmart, but um, <laughs> like some of, the, some, of the, some of the stylish places, like the reject shop doesn't do stylish Christmas. Um, but some of the, the stylish um, shopping centres, you know, like you, you'll see the Christmas tree and it'll be all like, you know, gold and silver, like all sort of like two-tone things. And so for those of you who don't yet have kids, like you can have really stylish Christmas setups. Um, those of you who do have kids realise you get whatever joyful thing your child brings home to decorate the tree with or grandkid, that you, that's just what you get. And so I know for a while there, my mum loved having like a like stylish Christmas tree but as soon as there are others to help decorate that, um, it becomes all sorts of colours and shapes and disgustiveness and whatever else. Um, it doesn't look like the Pinterest thing anymore. It's not this perfect thing. So um, rejoice and enjoy it while you've got it. Um, a time comes and you won't be able to go for that. Um, but I actually think it's not just modern, modern society and you know, all those kind of shops and advertisers that, that kind of started up. I actually think it, it almost comes back from like years ago. Um, the, anyone else watched last night A Christmas Carol, like this, you know, the whole Charles Dickens thing, you know, kind of roasting chestnuts on the fire, all that kind of idea of, you know, hoping for a white Christmas, which, no, we don't. Um, I'm hoping for a hot Christmas. I'll be near a pool, so I really want it to be hot. Um, but, you know, it's that kind of mythology of, oh, imagine a Christmas where, you know, you buy the biggest turkey in the shop and it's going to be this amazing, glorious thing. But so often it's not, you know. I know plenty of people can tell stories, and um, I could too, of, you know, there being moments of tension at Christmas or things that go wrong or the barbecue that blows up or the argument that happens or things that, you know, the present was a disaster or those kind of things that Christmas is so far removed from the first Christmas. I love, Tim was talking the other week and made mention about, you know, all the young mums and sort of questioning, would anyone want to go up to the hills to a barn and give birth there? Because that's what it was like for the first Christmas. So Mike and Chantel, they live in the hills. Like they've got animals right nearby them. And like 12 hours after having, giving birth, they were back there. Like I couldn't believe how quick it was. But you can rest assured that Chantel wanted to be in a nice ster- sterile, you know, hospital, like, like it, as anyone would. Um, that's part of why, you know, births go so well. You remove, you know, all that kind of stuff from animal feces and the bad stuff. Like, it's important. It's a development of humankind. We, we should be pleased and rejoice in that. Um, it helps with longevity. But it's so far removed from the first Christmas. And I sometimes think that the, the myth of Christmas that we're going for is actually probably more in line with what went on in Herod's palace. Than, than what happened in the first Christmas. That Herod would have had this great banquet. He would have been this one with never-ending food. But Mary and Joseph, they would have had whatever they could get, whatever they would have brought with them. Just simplicity. Just really basic stuff. What was needed rather than necessarily what was wanted. Um, so in, as it comes to Christmas time, you know, we look forward to the joy of Christmas, but I, I do find it fascinating that 
that um, the advertisers will kind of talk about, you know, the joy of your world, you know, that, that Christmas is about what, you know, you can get and what you can give to people and, you know, you really should um, make yourself feel good by being the most generous giver. Um, you know, you'll get better things if you're a generous giver and I'll tell some stories later about how that's not really me. Um, anyone who knows me knows that's um, the case. Um, but I just want us to stop and watch a little video for a moment about the first Christmas and about sort of stripping back some of the mythology of Christmas. So, um, James, we'll flick to that. One December night, over 2,000 years ago, a shining star illuminated a gathering of kings, shepherds, angels, and animals round a baby in a stable. It was the nativity, and it marked the end of a journey that began on a donkey's back. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It... hold up there, James. Yeah, I beg your pardon? Your nativity, that's not exactly how it happened. Here, look, let's start with that donkey. Neither of the gospel stories mentions Mary traveling by donkey. And given the 60 miles of rough terrain they traveled, it's more likely they used a wagon. <laughs> Minor details. But then the innkeeper informs uh, them there's no room. Again, the Bible doesn't actually mention an innkeeper. And in the Greek, the word inn refers to an upper room in a house, not an actual motel. Oh, blast. Look, wherever it was, there was no room. So, Mary and Joseph were sent to the stable. Uh, no stable. <sighs> Not in the Bible either. Now you're catching on. And in those days, most animals were typically kept in a cave. A cave? Yuppers. So it could have been that instead of a stable, the Bible doesn't really say. And the Star of Bethlehem? Duh, that's biblical. Well, we're actually right for once. It's a Christmas miracle. Okay, so now came the shepherds and the three kings. No kings. Three kings is from the song. The Bible says magi, which means wise men. Three wise men? That works. Well, not so fast. While the Bible does mention three gifts, it doesn't specify the number of wise men that brought them. You mean there could have been more? Oh, yeah. A whole posse, even. With a crowd like that, it's a miracle the baby Jesus never cried. What, no crying he makes? That's just a lyric from Away in a Manger, not actual scripture. <laughs> well, of course he was crying. You just added a whole crowd of strange men. Eh, yes and no. There may have been many wise men, but they weren't there that night. You see? Okay, that's enough. For the blooming star of Bethlehem, you've just dismantled the most inspiring image of Christian tradition. So what's your point? Point? Well, uh, I guess it's this. Even when all of the man-made traditions are stripped away, the eternal truths still remain. Whether they traveled by donkey or wagon, God brought them safely to the birthplace that was prophesied. Whether born in a stable or a cave, God provided shelter in a strange new land. Whether there were three kings, three wise men, or many, God called the elect to bear witness and testimony to the birth of Emmanuel. So whether your manger looks like this, or like this, the one thing that remains unchanged is this. A baby boy, born of a virgin, this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Bless you, sir. I'll never look at the miracle of December 25th the same way again. December 25th? Oh, I almost forgot. Stop that. Music! I think we do ourselves a disservice sometimes, getting caught up in the whole mythology of it all rather than actually stripping it back to what the Bible says. Um, because what the Bible says is important, like it is, something worth celebrating. Um, so that is great. Um, and I also like the whole concept of, you know, the shepherds turning up. Actually, there's kind of precedence for having randoms at Christmas. Um, Mary and Joseph had, you know, kind of random guys that they hadn't expected turn up for their first Christmas. And likewise, I think it gives us a reminder that inviting someone to join us who may not you know, know where to go for Christmas, there we go. It's biblical backing. Uh, so 
I want to also talk about the uh, gifts of Christmas. So first up, turn to the person nearby you and talk about what was the best gift you have received at Christmas time. All right, what's the best one? What do you got for us? Anyone want to share? CD Walkman. CD Walkman. Okay, that's good. That was a timely one. Anyone else? Yep, Julie. <laughs> that's, that's great. A little good, good, um, good scheme to sort of cover over it. That's good. Yep, Joanne. A teddy bear. Still got it. We had, we had one in the first service. Someone who'd received it 50 years ago. A, essentially a robot. Um, so that was pretty cool. Still working. Uh, for me, uh, I think, so my mum might correct me later. I don't know exactly the truth of it, but it doesn't matter. I'm up here and she's not. Um, <laughs> and so my birthday's in January. Do any others have those awful birthdays that combine with Christmas all the time? Yeah, I feel your pain. Um, but it does mean you can sometimes get, like, like much better presents than what your siblings get. So there's a good bit to that. So I remember getting like my CD player, uh, which I then used for the next like two decades. And there's, there's never been a present I've used as much as that CD player. Like I used to have, well, I've still got, I don't know, probably 700 CDs. And so the number of CDs that would have been played on that CD player is probably over 100,000. Um, so it was worth every cent and more for, for what I got for that. But probably the best Christmas present I ever saw was I remember one Christmas when we were about, I don't know, 18, 19, a mate of mine called me up and said, can I come round to show you my Christmas present? Thinking, wow, that, that doesn't normally happen. Um, like we're blokes, don't really care what you get, you don't really care what I get. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, sure, if you if it means something to you. And he came round and he was driving his Christmas present. His parents bought him a new charade. And I was just like, get out, a brand new car. Um, it was kind of like a tax dodge thing because his dad owned the business. And you know, it, <laughs> there, there was sense to it. And also he was an only child. Those only children, they get it easy. Um, they get better gifts. Um, but uh, that was... That was a pretty great Christmas present. Now, I won't get you to share with the person next to you about what was the worst ever Christmas present, because when you share that story, it just makes you look ungrateful. Um, I could tell you that, and it would make me look ungrateful, but instead, I'll tell you the worst ever Christmas present I gave. So, I, as I stated, I'm not the most generous person. Um, people who know me know that. And so, there was one Christmas where I got given a photo frame. So, this was life pre-kids. You know, we had enough photos of ourselves around the place. How many photos do you need? You're just looking back at you of who you are and what you've done, like whatever. Um, so my sister gave it to me and thought, yeah, yeah, it's nice. We didn't put a photo in it, and a few weeks later we just put it in the cupboard. And so we've got a present cupboard. So if you go to the shops and you find something that's cheap and good value, you, 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 know, you might buy it and put it in the present cupboard. And if you know, if one day I come to a birthday party of yours and you get a present that you think is kind of uninspired, it may have come from the present cupboard. <laughs> um, and sometimes things that go in the present cupboard might be a present that I got given and it went there. And so then next Christmas for my sister, I thought, what have we got in the present cupboard? Oh yeah, that, that, that frame, that looks all right. Um, photo frame, she, she likes photos of herself. Gave it to her, complete straight faced, not remembering in any way. It's 12 months ago, what am, how am I meant to remember what I got given. And so she unwrapped it. It's a photo frame from Bangladesh. How did you get that? You're giving it back to me. Oh, Scott. And she let loose and told me all about it. Um, <laughs> but because sometimes, you know, you know, things slip my mind. You know, it's, um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not the, the greatest gift giver. As Jazz knows, as she will be getting another tub of M&Ms for Christmas. Um, and she'll go and buy stuff that she wants because it's generally worked out poorly when I've bought her clothes and jewellery and things and 
He tells me, are you trying to make me look like that person or that person? It's not me. Great. You buy what is you, and I'll buy what's me. Um, and everyone's, everyone's happy. But anyway, gifts for Christmas, the first gifts for Christmas, when we see in the, the start of the Christmas narrative, the, um, the shepherds turning up, it always makes me wonder, did they bring a gift? Like it's... You know, it's a Middle East culture. The, there's a real hospitality culture. If you turn up to someone's house, they would prepare some food for you to prove that they're hospitable. And if you turn up to someone's house, you would generally bring a gift. So there's no mention of it, but it does make me wonder whether there was something small that they gave, some, you know, a shiny stone, some nice wildflowers, something to sort of bring along to say, here is my little memento of coming to see you. And clearly it wasn't good enough to be left in the biblical narrative. I don't know, was wildflowers even a thing 2,000 years ago? Or was it just us that I like the idea of some sort of organic matter that slowly decays in front of you and was a gift at some stage? Flowers, best idea ever. Um, <laughs> but, um, but then we see, with the, we see with the wise men, the magi. Now they gave gifts. Gifts to be remembered for all time. Like gold. Now that is a handy gift. When you're fleeing and going to Egypt, Mary and Joseph having gold, thank you. We've got some currency to escape, some currency to live off. If he's not going to be working for a while, that is, that is great. Living you know, hand to mouth, it is, that is God's provision for Mary and Joseph. Uh, of course, gold is also a, a reminder. It is, it is a gift fit for a king. Uh, you know, we're reminded that it is, uh, that, so is gold frankincense, like incense, that is, of course, uh, a, a gift or um, an offering to a god. Like you'd burn um, incense when you came to temple. Um, so people, you know, kind of know, you know, the, you know, two out of the three, you know, gold, oh, that makes sense. That's, that's worthwhile. Everyone wants gold. Um, that's you know, a, a gift fitting for a king. Incense, well, that's a gift fitting for a god. Myrrh, myrrh's the strange one. Uh, myrrh, you know, it's not part of you know, what we know. But myrrh was thought to have healing properties. It could be used for, you know, as a medicine. And we know that Jesus comes to heal. Jesus comes to restore a broken humanity. And of course, myrrh was also used as an, as an embalming um, thing for, for, for one who has died. And so it is, it's such, such, such a strange, wonderful symbolism we see in the gifts by the Magi. Again, hinting at Jesus' deity with the incense and hinting at his humanity, um, at his death. Uh, with the myrrh. This is wonderful. What a great example of gifts. So, so we could be a culture that gives gifts because Jesus was given a gift at Christmas time. You know, in the same way that we could, we could do baptism because Jesus did baptism. So, you know, yes, we too are going to do baptism. But it's actually so much more than that. That we actually give gifts because, uh, not just because they gave gifts, not just because you know, the, the wise men or the shepherds came and gave gifts. But it's actually more than that, that at the heart of it, it is because Jesus is the gift, that it is God giving of himself. Throughout history, as we did the, you know, been doing the 66 love letters and looking at some of the key characters, guys like Moses, guys like Joshua, guys like Gideon, they all at different times made comments about how unworthy they felt, how much they were struggling, how much they, they needed God. And what did God say back to them? To each, each of those three characters, he said to them, I will be with you. And so in Jesus, we are, we are shown a God who says to all of humanity, I will be with you. God among us, Emmanuel, God with us. God who leaves the glory of heaven and comes and enters into the human condition. A God who can relate to us, relate to what it's like to struggle with hunger, hunger, to struggle with tiredness, 
to struggle with busyness, to struggle with family and friends, to be let down, to have ups and downs, to have emotions, to have temptation. How remarkable it is that we don't have a distant God who looks and sees, who kind of might know, who can just sort of see the hearts, but someone who's actually had a physical heart, who knows what it's like to sweat, who knows what it's like to run, who knows what it's like to get splinters, who knew what it was like to be born and experience what it was like to die. That's the kind of God we have that loves us. Isn't that glorious to know that Jesus comes as the gift from God to be able to relate to us? And so at Christmas time, we come and are reminded to accept this gift, to be grateful, to respond in gratefulness to God, to say thank you amidst all the rushing around of Christmas, amidst all the the busy family times, friend times, all the work do's, all the things that go on to actually have time to quiet and still ourselves and say, thank you, God, for the gift that you've given me, the best Christmas gift of all, the gift that shaped all of history, the gift that changed our lives, that we accept this and that it changes everything for us. And then we go on from there to actually ask of ourselves, will we also give of ourselves this Christmas? We live in a culture where we're encouraged, you know, get out there and spend money, go and give, you know, give money, give gifts, give things to people so that they too may fill up their present cupboard and one day wonder what they've got it for, who it came from, more stuff. But we have a God who gave of himself. I actually think it's a great example to us that we wouldn't just give stuff wouldn't just give vouchers or money or things, that we'd actually give of ourselves this Christmas time, that we would be people that give of our heart, that give of our time, that we listen, that we care. Sometimes gifts can actually be a defence, so that we don't have to, you know, feel too bad about, you know, really engaging with people. Hey, I, I did my bit, I gave you that. But actually giving of our time, and listening to people, is a far greater gift, giving him our, of our very selves. I think that's what Jesus calls us to do, that we would people that care that much, that we would follow his example, that as we rest in the assurance of his love for us, that we can actually give of ourselves. Let us pray. Uh, thank you, Lord God for your generosity towards us, for the way that you gave of yourself. And thank you for the great gift of Jesus, that it is because of Jesus that you understand what it's like to enter into the human condition, that you know uh, what it's like, the temptations, the struggles, all that we go through, the ups and downs of life. We thank you, uh, great God, for that. Lord Jesus, we, we accept your gift in this season of busyness, of this season um, of Christmas, that we enjoy these celebrations so much, but we sometimes do feel overwhelmed. And we just want to take this time to, again, accept your love, to enjoy that you, the great God of this universe, were born... Uh, into poverty for our sakes to show us how to live. Lord, we thank you for your death, for your resurrection, that it's because of that that we are born into new life, that you have shaped our, in, our eternity, our destiny, and that that shapes our today and tomorrow. We thank you for that, Lord Jesus. In your precious name, amen.